Hi, Cecil. Uh, hi, Rishi. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome, Peter, yeah, to join us again. So we are so honored to have you today. I cannot wait to uh, yeah, learn from you about uh, AI and ethics and to talk about free will. Uh, yes, I always like talking about that in interesting topics. Uh, yeah, we will yeah, be we starting will be st shortly. Uh, welcome to Quantum Photonics, Peter. And uh, yeah, thank you for supporting us and uh, for accepting our invitation. Uh, you are a favorite guest of Quantum Photonics. So uh, we will start now. We are on recording and uh, uh, more people will be coming in in a while. So uh, for those of you who haven't known Peter yet, um, Peter is a pioneer in artificial intelligence who in 2001 coined the term AGI or Artificial General Intelligence with fellow AI luminaries. Peter is an engineer, scientist and inventor as well as a serial entrepreneur and leader. He started in electronics engineering, then fell in love with software. First major success was developing a comprehensive ERP package and taking that company from zero to a 400-person IPO in, IPO in seven years. Um, fueled by the fragile nature of software, Peter embarked on a journey 20 years ago to studying what intelligence is, how it develops in human, and the current state of AI. This research culminated in the creation of our natural language intelligence engine that can think, learn, and reason, and adapt in and grow with the user. Currently focused on commercializing the second generation of our most advanced conversation Conversational AI technology called IGO. Uh, IGO is the most advanced natural language interaction platform built on the human brain like cognitive architecture. IGO is uh, on a mission to provide highly intelligent and hyper personalized assistance for everyone. So, yeah, um, I would like to um, welcome Peter here and I pass the mic to him. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So um, those of you who were last time here, I did talk about epistemology a little bit and how, uh, why I believe that is so important. Um, so epistemology or theory of knowledge. And I'll start there again, because I think uh, it's really an important foundation for being able to talk about complex topics such as ethics and free will and consciousness. So um, one of the key things of, of human intelligence that one needs to understand are concepts. Um, concepts are generalizations of entities or activities. So, you know, quite simply, uh, if you say an apple, you may have seen many different apples or car or house or whatever that's an entity or activities it would be like running or hopping or swimming or you know whatever they, they could of course be much more complex uh, activities so that's what concepts are and you know they we we uh, humans can also form very abstract concepts um you know such uh, such as government and uh, honesty and and things like that and you know consciousness so the formation how we form concepts depends on input features that we perceive so i'm talking about the the basic perceptual concept not abstract concepts but basic perceptual uh, concepts uh, you know such as running or apple or car um, depend on the input features so there's some some of the things are hardwired by biology, um, such as ed edge detection or being able to differentiate colors and things like that. Um, so there's some innate structure that, that helps us form concepts that are actually practical in, in life that help us that help us survive um, but there's also uh, another component to it and uh, <clears throat> that determines whether we form a concept or not and that is the need do we have a need for it 
what is what is the relevance of it you know do we need to separate it and um you know i can give an example here of of uh, starting with child development so when when a, a, an infant initially forms a concept of you know dogs and cats typically they they lump them together uh, because they kind of the same thing you know and they call them doggy uh, usually uh, even if it's a cat now obviously depending on whether you have cats or dogs in the house and or whether they come across them so initially they might just lump them lump them together and they really just have one concept for pets with you know four legs that are more or less like that and have a tail and but of course then it becomes at some point it becomes obvious that there you really need to treat them differently they have different uh, you know different attributes so uh, the concept then gets split into cats and dogs and um, of course if you are interested in dogs and you'll be uh, then you'll split this further into different breeds and if you're a dog breeder you would actually have very fine granulation so the the point i want to make here is um that concepts do not exist out there in some platonic ideal which is a mistake from plato um you know that there's some ideal chair or dog or cat or, or whatever out out there somewhere you know um that's not that's not the case it's basically the utility we have of forming concepts based on things we perceive um so the, the formation of of concepts in humans can happen in a number of different ways it can be from a from an ai point of view it can be unsupervised so that means it's automatic it's autonomous um so you know for example you would probably form the concept of oranges and apples and bananas um automatically because they are entities that are you know quite different and um so those those basic um the, the basic categorization can or and concept formation can happen unsupervised but then we also have supervised learning basically where somebody uh, points points at a certain thing and says well this is a dog and and that's a cat so that's supervised you basically have a have a label or a signal to it um so that that's supervised learning there's also reinforcement learning and here i'm using terms from uh, ai uh, but they really ap- apply to sort of cognitive psychology and you know uh, human development ch- child development so the another uh, way of forming concept is through an, what's called an ai reinforcement learning so that's really sort of pleasure and pain uh signals that that you get that say well this is this is something that's bad i need to avoid and that's something that's that's uh, good and you can basically learn different things uh, obviously uh animals often get trained uh with that sort of reinforcement you know via giving them treats um so we we learn like that as well but then for humans it's also there's this highest level where we can learn concepts through reasoning and through explanation so for example um just uh, through uh, you know through through a description in a in wikipedia or in a dictionary or so you can learn a new concept that you didn't know before um uh, you know or reading a book the, the, the context can tell you what this concept actually is is about now um the concepts are not the same as the words and the labels that refer to them and that should be pretty obvious because the label itself uh, could of course be in any any language and would still be uh, referring to the same concept so whether you say dog in english or you say hund in in in, in german uh, that's just a label attached to the concept um but that's extremely powerful because these labels the words and language that we have allow us to mentally activate the concepts the underlying concepts with all of their richness so when i say a dog or hund it 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 activates basically what we know some in in our brains it activates the many of the things we know about dogs um and depending on the context um and our experience that might be a good thing or a bad thing so the 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 sort of third thing concepts words and the the third thing i want to highlight here uh 
is the idea of context. So concepts are inherently contextual when we use them. They basically what they refer to um, depends on the context. It depends on what the current situation is, what has gone before, uh, what your current purpose is, your situation, and and so on. So there's basically you know you you could point to a to a dog, and but it's actually a toy dog. So that's a very different has very different characteristics. Um, from a normal dog, so it, it shares some of some of the characteristics of dogs, but in you know in, in other things it overlaps with characteristics of toy. But you could still be pointing to, you know, a toy dog and and, and call it a dog. So then the the context would tell you what the difference is, or it could be a guard dog, which again has different implications of how you would think about and what you how you would use that concept. So the, the reason I, I'm spending time on talking about this as, again is because concepts are so important and it's, it's important to realize that concepts are formed for a reason to, to uh, achieve a, a certain purpose. So, um, and he, I, I don't really want to break now for, for Q&A, so if you have questions on that, maybe you can make a note of them. So let me jump into ethics, um, and I'll use the word ethics here rather than morality, because morality, um, for news, and, and I use them as synonyms, basically, I mean the same thing, ethics and morality, but I tend to not use the word, like to use the word morality, because it, it sort of has emotional loading, some people you know, immediately have a negative, con you know, strong negative reaction to morality. Um, so I, I talk about the more sort of technical term ethics, but I really mean, mean the same thing. So why do we have this concept? Why do we need this concept? Where does it come from? Uh, what in reality gives rise to it? You know, why did humans come up with, with the concept of, of ethics? So the, the reason uh, ethics are useful is that if we have generalized principles that can help guide us towards flourishing, and I'll unpack what I what I, I mean by that, but I think you kind of get get an idea of that. Then it it allows us to deal with the complexity of 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 the world much better. So. Basically, in principle, you say there are certain ways of uh, acting and responding that are generally positive, that are going to help us uh, survive or help us flourish. So it would be, you know, would be things like whether you tell the truth or not, or whether you should just kill somebody or, you know, whatever it might be, whatever the different things are. And these generalized rules... Um, we can internalize, we can automatize them so that we basically habitually uh, act in a certain way then so that we don't have to, you know, stop and think for everything that happens in life, should we be lying or shouldn't we be lying, you know, just to, to use a, a, a simple example, that they would, that, you know, we, we would basically acquire these what are called virtues, or if they're negative, they're called vices, which is sort of a predisposition to act, act in a certain way, generalized rules of uh, behavior and, and responses. Now, of course, we do override them, and, in, in, uh, you know, they're kind of more like default ways of dealing with the world. Um, but that's just... You know, it's essential, actually, because, you know, we need to make split-second decisions uh, many times in, you know, in, in life to how to react to, to, to something. Now, I want to go back and talk more about flourishing, uh, survival and flourishing. Well, who's flourishing and who's survival? Is it society or the individual and the, or the individual and society? And over the years, um, uh, over the eons, it, it, that, that really has changed to some extent. 
ethics used to be, I believe, um, well, philosophers have, have certainly had both views of it. You know, they, they have been philosophers um, going back to Aristotle and and and, and so on that um, you know believed it it should be first and foremost uh, focused on individual behavior and and individual benefit. Um, but the way ethics has been hijacked often by religion and by a, a government uh, is for it to serve society, um, to, to put it nicely. Uh, but it could also be just to serve some, um, you know, some despot, uh, whether it's um, a religious leader or whether it's uh, a king or, or whatever that it serves them to actually promote a certain ethic that will promote their well-being rather than that of the individual. So let me let me go now to to a question that has has really baffled um, philosophers, um, you know, over the eons, and that is a question: Where do we get ethics from? What tells us what's right or wrong or, or good or bad? And it's, it's, I found when I started studying philosophy, I found it amazing that none of the well-known philosophers actually got an, got an answer to that. Uh, I found that really hard to believe, you know, that over 2,000 years of philosophy, there wasn't an answer. Uh, one of my favorite philosophers, uh, Bertrand Russell, for example, um, in his last book, um, that, that he wrote, which was sort of a review of his of, it was an autobiography, and you know he spoke about all the different phases he went through and what he learned and so on. And he said, "I've never been able to figure out how we determine right or wrong or good or bad." So that that was really quite remarkable. Now um, there is in fact a philosopher that, that I came across um, who did have that answer. But before I give you the answer, let me run through. Normally, if I ask people, you know, where, where do you think uh, it comes from? Or if you read books about ethics, usually uh, people talk about, well, there are three sources, potential sources of, of ethics that tells us what's good and bad, right or wrong, what are virtues and, and what are vices. Uh, the first one is uh, religion, obviously. Now, I don't know how how much I need how much time I would need to spend to convince you that that's a really bad source of good and bad or right or wrong because obviously religions violently disagree about what's 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 right or wrong um, and you know they have certainly promoted many evils over over the eons so it certainly doesn't seem to be a very reliable uh, source of, of of ethics the second source that people say if, if they don't think it comes from religion or should come from religion is they say well it's what society decides decides on you know society societal norms uh, uh, is, is basically where you get your morality from so you grow up in a certain society and what the society d decides is, is right or you know is good now I think it's also pretty obvious that that's kind of just as bad because there clearly are societies that have some pretty awful uh, ethics, you know, in terms of slavery or how women are treated. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure you're aware of many of those. So, um, in fact, I'll just tell you uh, from my own experience, I lived in South Africa for many years um, and I knew many people there um, that really believed in their hearts that, you know, black people should live and develop separately from, from white people. And that was a good thing. It was good for both parties. It was, you know, it was the, uh, the virtuous thing to support. And they really believed that, they, you know, because they grew up in, in that kind of environment and was, I guess, never challenged. And they really believed that was a good thing. And so, you know, that's copy, copying or getting your, your values from society. Um, 
Now, of course, more recently, we can look at Saudi Arabia or we can you know, look at a number of countries where we would be, um, I think most of us would probably be feel pretty obviously that the so the ethics of the society, the morality of the society has, has some problems. Um, now, the if you reject those two as the right source of um, of ethics, the third one that, that often people mention is, well, I have a moral compass. I just know. And, and that's kind of the conclusion I came to personally in thinking about it, you know, that, um, well, I have a moral compass and it, it tells me what's right or wrong. But that doesn't really stand up to scrutiny either because how does our moral compass get calibrated? How does it get set up? Um, and it, it's hugely influenced, obviously, by uh, religion, if we grow up in, uh, religiously, and by society, you know, what our parents tell us, what our teachers tell us, what our friends tell us, and, and, and so on. So that moral compass, um, I think there's something about it that's right, that we can kind of, you know, think about things, think them through, but the moral compass is really primarily driven by sort of an emotional response. You know, does it feel right? Does it feel wrong? And where does that feeling come from? It comes from that indoctrination of, of uh, religion and society. So the moral compass is also a bust. And, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned, the motivation often uh, for... for um, teachers, religious leaders, or, you know, kings or uh, society uh, generally, is often to control people and to make them conform. And um, so, you know, that uh, in, in that way, immorality can be a, a, a very negative thing, because it may not necessarily be good for the individual at all. And it might not be good for society either. So, for example, sacrifice uh, is usually seen as as a virtue, and obedience um, uh, uh, that you should you know be uh, uh, obedient or nationalism and things like that are often taught as virtues, and you know that's created a lot of cannon fodder where people people will basically say, well, I'm doing something virtuous, I'm defending my country irrespective of whether it's really defense or, or, or not. So if those three things, if we can throw them out, religion, society, and the moral compass, then what is it? And um, so the philosopher I came across um, some years ago who uh, figured that out is, is uh, Ayn Rand. And she developed a philosophy called objectivism. Now, there's a lot of controversial aspects to objectivism and Ayn Rand, and I don't really want to go go into that. But she, in my opinion, she absolutely got it right where we got our where, where we should get our morality from, uh, our ethics, and that is through rationality, basically treating ethics as a science. If the goal of ethics is for human flourishing. And I think one can define reasonably well what is flourishing or what is not flourishing. Um, so, if you know, if it is for human flourishing, then what are the principles? What are the virtues that are more likely to help us achieve that goal or get closer to that goal? So, so I think that is the way to look at ethics: to to basically rationally go through behaviors and principles and figure out, are these behaviors, are these principles, these generalized principles, uh, to pro-flourishing or not? So if we look at conventional uh, virtues that are often you know, seen as virtues like faith and obedient, obedience, um, and you analyze it rationally, I, I think you come to the conclusion that those are actually vices and not virtues. Uh, in fact, the original sin is uh, seeking knowledge and or rationality. You know, Adam and the apple, Adam and Eve and the apple is really about y you should not be seeking new knowledge, independent knowledge. You should not be rational. 
uh, you should have just follow faith and you know be, be obedient. So it's actually completely upside down. Um, rationality is actually the biggest virtue that we have is to think about things to be informed and to uh, make decisions based on uh, to make decisions based rationally uh, pride is seen as another uh, vice pride is actually a virtue if properly seen because it in uh, what it refers to is the achievement and productivity the real achievement the real productivity uh, of a person and if somebody is productive they produce things of value um, that is a benefit to themselves it's a benefit to society and having pride in what you do in the quality of of things that you do and pride in the way you interact with other people i'm not talking about false pride of course here i'm talking about pride that's actually a virtue and not a vice. Now, I've written extensively about that. There's an essay, um, Rational Ethics, um, that is, uh, is quite long, uh, that I believe you have a link to, to that. Um, but I wanted to talk about um, ethics from the perspective of human ethics and what I believe should guide us in ethics on how we figure out what's right or wrong, good and bad. Because when we talk about AI, then the same thing applies. And now suddenly, when the, the, when your ethics is based on rationality, when you look at it as a science, you can see that an AI could actually help us figure out ethics. It could reason better than we can or help us uh, figure things out. So an AI would could help us improve our ethics, our understanding of ethics. Um, but also it inherently is likely to embody this kind of rational ethic. Because it, you know, it will come to those conclusions that, that I just spoke about. So yeah, this is all pretty controversial. Um, and but I believe it's correct. And, you know, we put it up there <laughs> for you. So next section is about free will. So again, I ask in terms of forming a concept, why did we form this concept of free will? Where does it come from? You know, what what's the need in, in reality for that? Um, what in reality gives rise to the concept of free will? Where did where did it arise in in, in human interaction? Um, I think the most obvious thing where free will comes from is to determine whether somebody is responsible for their actions or not. So that um, you know that relates to fairness and justice, punishment and law. So as soon as you have some kind of a society, human society, that can think about, um, yeah, think about fairness and justice, then you sort of automatically come to the to point of saying, well, could is that person responsible for their action? Did they choose to do what they did, or was it accidental? You know, with, with, or were there was there no option? Um, or was it something they actually thought about or could have thought about, should have thought about, and decided to do that was, you know, good or bad? So do they get credit for it or, you know, do, do they, are they made responsible for, for what they did? And clearly some of, some of uh, our actions and also comparing it to animal actions, we typically don't believe that animals have free will or have, uh, have, a lot of free will if it's on a continuum so animals typically we don't really say they are responsible for doing it because we we see them more as being driven by um, built and you know built in drives basically by na nature uh, and through stimulus and response kind of thing so they don't think or reason about uh, about their decisions by and large um, I mean, there's some argument and some of the higher animals 
um, might have some, uh, you know, limited sort of free will or capacity to look at alternatives. I think one can sometimes see that in pets where pets where they kind of you, they know they're doing something naughty and they do it anyway. Um, but clearly, it's not at all at the same level of understanding and reasoning that uh, that humans can bring to this. So, so th I think that's where the concept of free will, why it's important to to have that, to basically contrast, to differentiate between things that you did um, or, or could have reasonably that you you selected, and you could have reasonably selected a different course of action. Um, now, if you are co coerced, if somebody holds a gun to your head, uh, then it undermines your free will. You will do, you know, whatever you you told at that point. So it's not a free will decision that you're making at that point, usually. Um, then there's also the the question of if you're under the influence of something, you know, drugs or sleep deprived, or a crime of passion. You know, we kind of understand that you weren't really exercise be, be you weren't really able to exercise or you didn't exercise um uh, your your course of action in a in a rational or conscious way now of course it becomes a gray area and a slip, sl slippery slope but i believe free will exists on a continuum or the the exercise of free will is continuum and so basically that there are situations where you have diminished volitional capacity. Now, the, the, actually, as, as a matter of interest, there have been some studies made, and actually the, the studies that are pro this point I'm making, and there are some studies that apparently refuted. I, I've not delved into it deeply enough uh, to to be sure which which study uh, is is right or uh, what it is, but there is certainly the argument that can be made that if you believe in free will, um, you actually tend to exercise it more, and you tend to it tends to improve your life. I it kind of makes sense to me. If you don't believe there's free will, if you believe you are just um, a slave of nature and nurture, or that determinism just drives you down a certain path that then there's there's no meaningful way in which you are in charge of 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 your trajectory of you know of your future if you believe that so if you believe there is no free will um then you would i would imagine you would you would tend to not try and change the course of your life as much as somebody who believes in free will so to me it it seems kind of obvious that that should be the thing but as i say there have been studies that apparently have supported this view and there are studies that apparently have refuted that um so i think that's it on free will for now and the last section on consciousness i'll keep very short uh, i did talk about it before um and what i'm talking about here is human consciousness and Again, I'll use a different word because consciousness itself has a lot of baggage. There's sort of, uh, yeah, it's it's a kind of a very complex thing, and people I think read more into it than is is justified. So I'll I'll talk more. I'll use the word awareness, self-awareness, um, and that's really to me the the key component or the important component of human consciousness is self-awareness that you are aware of yourself as an agent acting in the world. So you are aware of the fact that you have a brain, you make decisions, you think, um, or you, you certainly, you know, you can um, do that. So it's an awareness of partial awareness of your thought processes. Um, but more importantly, it's, a, it's awareness that you are an agent acting, acting in the world. Of course, you know, with the influences of the, the environment and the world that you you live in and you know with the understanding there are um you know we are pre-programmed to some extent and biased and and all of that but we are still an agent we can uh, start certain chains of events in the world or react to things in the world so with that uh description of consciousness um 
it actually be, it actually becomes a byproduct of intelligence and concept formation that if you have a certain level of intelligence you you will form a concept of yourself as an acting agent and that will be true for an ai an ai cannot be intelligent uh, cannot be fully intelligent without having that concept that self concept uh, that it can act on the world that it can reason about things and make decisions and then you know make choices and that capacity it's it's contro- the control that it has in the world is limited it's, it's a limit capacity so it is an agent with certain capacities that acts on the world but once it has that as a concept that it can use in its decision making itself which it needs to it needs to know that you know um whether it uh, for example said something or somebody else said something uh or you know clicked something on a web page or somebody else clicked something on a web page so it needs to know about its own actions and in fact it needs to know about its own thought processes in order to be able to optimize them so um the the other part of consciousness i'll just mention it because i'm sure some people will ask about it is the whole thing of qualia and what it feels like to be you know blind or a bat or whatever the the qualia what does it feel like to see red i think it's a kind of just a philosophical boondoggle um of course it feels like something uh for for us there's all the um, um, you know um, emotional machinery that we have the biological machinery that we have and you know that our heart rate or we might sweat or we might get excited or or, or whatever you know it just feels like something of course now an an ai will have a very very different experience and i you know a much sparser experience because it's not going to have the same kind of biology and and body that that we have so the qualia will be uh, if we want to put it that way much much less certainly extremely different but i think it's kind of irrelevant it doesn't really buy you anything to go down that road so um the the final thing that i want to just tie tie together is that of course an ai will or also have free will um by the by the definition of free will that i've given here the ability the the, the knowledge that you are an agent acting in the world and the knowledge that you can make different choices that will have different outcomes in the world and that some of these choices um you know will have a positive outcome and other choices will have a negative outcome in by whatever measure of positive and negative um you have so um i think that's that's it um leave um, you know quite a bit of time for discussion and clarification Um, hi Peter. Hi Peter. Um, oh, I can hear myself. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, great talk, and it's great seeing you again. Um, it's, uh, I think, like it's it, it's uh, about time that we probably should be able to discuss these things with the advent of AI. That um, we, we should probably have some kind of formal definition as to what um, ethics and free will okay. entail. Okay. so that we can have um sort of a cemented understanding as to what these are and so that we can use that and and um in the AIs and the AI um that we're going to use because uh, eventually we're going to be headed that way anyway so i have um a few questions that um based on what you discussed so you um kind of emphasized on the um the fact that individual morality is actually far more better than uh sort of like the uh collective wisdom um in a way I'm kind of paraphrasing here but um do you think uh, one one of the things that I was thinking of was that probably um when we 
we talked about the collective wisdom where probably confining ourselves to specific geographical location but what we can extend that to the entire world and take the sort of like the consensus in that level do you think that would trump or override that individual morality and the reason why i say that is because um we are under constant influence ourselves ourselves we, uh, i mean like that there are some cases where our um, you know, our brain makes rational decisions, like, for example, if we're famished or if we are under duress, like you just mentioned, or if you, if you are under um, sort of like influence of psychoactive drugs, or even if you have like some kind of mental disorder, we're bound to make rational decisions. So uh, I don't see that to be like a, a very s solid way of, you know, cementing morality. But I want to hear like what your your take is on the sort of like the collective wisdom, but um, sort of literally expanded beyond geographical bounds, as opposed to like a, a confined one. So I'd probably start with that one. Uh, yeah, no, I, th I think that is um, it, it's not very terribly useful. I think it just suffers from the same limitations that um, you know, we, we often go in the wrong direction as a society. And I mean, if you look at, for example, what's happening in the world now, I'm not sure that uh, taking a democratic poll of what, you know, what, what people are doing right now, or what they think is right, uh, is necessarily a, a good guide. Um, but I, I need to clarify that the alternative is not that each individual just sort of willy-nilly comes up with their own morality and you know and says that's it i was very clear to emphasize that it's it should be treated as a science now how do we treat science you know science is basically you accumulate evidence you debate things you know you you go through hypotheses you test hypotheses and it's a collective effort but that collective effort is driven by two things it's driven by rationality, and it's driven by uh, real-world feedback. Basically, what is what is the, you know what is the world telling us? What is reality telling us? Because you can rationalize something, come up with you know a complex uh, you know construct that seems to be coherent, that seems to make sense. Like maybe com the original communism, maybe that made sense. I mean, I, I when I was younger, I thought hey, that sounds really, really great, you know, uh, communism. Um, and, but, you know, then you have to have a reality check and say, well, does, do the assumptions that you make actually pan out in the real world? What, what is the real world? Does your, is your hypothesis actually true? You know, are your assumptions true? So it's not about an individual uh, with, with, you know, all the biases that we have and the, the baggage we have and, as you say, failures of, of thought, um, w w w all the influences we have. So I'm, I'm all for people from across the world and different backgrounds getting together in this scientific endeavor, provided that they follow the scientific principles, which are rationality and reality check. Gotcha. That makes a far more gotcha. better sense so far more than the one the one that I have in mind. Um, I'll ask a second question since we have more audience, like more uh, people on the on the stage here. Um, so you said something about sort of um, you know your interpretation of free will, um, <clears throat> but um, my personal belief is that free will can be um, treated or free will should be treated as something which is. Uh, which could be like an emergent behavior or an emergent um, uh, in, like idea as opposed to like a, an intrinsic one. Um, what do you think of that? Because like that, that for me, that would potentially discard the anthropocentric um, sort of definition that we have of, of free will, like when we kind of um, bestow uh, free will to ourselves as, uh, you know, sort of the, the top of the food chain, but we uh, neglect other animal behaviors that seem to have um, some kind of parallel, even um, even better behavioral practices in other animals. So um, 
do you think free will is sort of is is kind of an emergent behavior pretty much like uh, the you know our neural network in our brain um no i do not see it um well emergent is sort of a, a quite uh, a loaded term and i think it can mean different things to different people um so i would say emergent yes if we if i if i take the interpretation that it's a byproduct of intelligence uh it's a byproduct of human level intelligence it's a byproduct of the ability to think and reason abstractly it's a byproduct of human consciousness of self-awareness so um, in that sense uh, it it is emergent but it's not emergent in the sense that you know i i don't know um it would emerge in you know an animal or ants or whatever that's not free will um uh, you know again as i explained and i have written extensively ab- about it uh, you know if you want to uh, dive deeper into it uh it is a, a uniquely human thing that we have it's uh, the 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 uh, the ability to make choices with awareness of the fact that you are an agent making a choice and and only humans really have that capacity to any significant degree now uh, i do want to uh, something i think i mentioned in the last talk but i for for those who may not uh, remember or went went there is i do actually have two uh, two essays and the the one essay is that yes we have free will and it's compatible with determinism now that philosophical position is called uh, compatibility uh, compatibilism um so my original conclusion and uh, was that that was a good way of presenting it you know that um free will properly understood the kind of the way i described it now and determinism the modern view of determinism that in- incorporates chaos theory and uh, and quantum mechanics and you know and and things like that that kind of uh, in, uh understanding of determinism the two things are are compatible um especially chaos theory quantum this uh, quantum physics is really a red herring in this whole thing uh the um uncertainty quantum mans uncertainty is uh, or randomness um uh, really has nothing nothing to do with free will uh just undermines it uh you know it's 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 irrelevant to it um so i i wrote the first very long uh analysis analysis which took me quite quite a few months to research and and write uh but then as i discussed this with many people i found that a certain percentage of people just had a mental block they said there can't be such a thing as free will in a deterministic world and their understanding was so deeply ingrained that what free will is that we can somehow like we have a soul you know that we can make choices that are not um that are not controlled by our brain that basically there's a separation between thought and the um and and the, the substrate the brain now uh, i'm is, assuming here for my my position is I, i think science has progressed enough that we we actually are very certain now that there is no soul and that the the thoughts we have are direct uh are directly caused by the substrate of of the brain and and vice versa that the thoughts then change the brain uh, brain structure but it, anyway um as i say i found i found people that really just could not wrap their heads around that free will could exist so i wrote the second essay saying we don't have free will we have something better <laughs> so it's a bit tongue in cheek of course but it's sort of saying okay forget about the term free will but we have a capacity give it whatever name you want to give it call it vol- volition call it x um that allows us to make choices <clears throat> with um awareness basically with awareness of the fact that we are making the choices we are an agent okay yeah, yeah i want to ask uh, you uh, 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 uh,
excuse me excuse me harsh um yeah i i think uh, we have to go in ptr order if uh, there are other people who want to ask questions and i want to remind the um, uh, people on stage to please be respectful of uh, the time of uh, the speaker and also of the other um people who wanted to uh, speak so let's go in ptr if there are questions i did not hear if uh, abyss you were your question was answered uh, by peter yeah, it was. Um, yeah, I thanked him for that. So we can probably move on to the next person. Um, Rajarshi, if you have a question, or CRF Sisio, if you have questions. I, I think I'm waiting for a bit. I think there's a few people on stage, so maybe let's take theirs and then come back. Okay, fair enough. Frank, go ahead. In this scenario, is the uh, is the AGI a servant of some kind? Is it is it is it designed to to fill the need uh, some need of humanity? Uh, yes, we are in, inherently AGIs that we are building. We are building building them to to serve our purpose to basically help us do things um, and. Um, Unlike humans, who have, you know, we have our DNA, our the way we are we are built. There's a lot of our motivation, and I tend to refer to it to the reptile brain. Um, you know, there's a lot of motivation inherently for survival and reproduction uh, that drives a lot of the things that we do. In fact, our rationality, our high-level thinking and, and reasoning, is kind of an, uh, an evolutionary afterthought. So we, we tend not to be very good at that. Now, an AI inherently will not have that reptile brain. There's no reason for us to build them. I don't know anybody building one. It wouldn't be super effective anyway. Uh, that would, would you know have this uh, major drive of um, survival and reproduction. So yes, we build them to, to basically help us figure things out. Uh, that's pretty much all the people I talk to and uh, uh, that are working on AGI, um, that that's their motivation, whether it's to help us uh, solve, you know, world hunger or cure cancer or life extension or pollution, you know, and so on. So, so it would be true AI, but, but we would essentially be, be, be creating slaves. Uh, for lack of a better word. Uh, well, yeah, and, 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 and I think it really lacks <laughs> a better word <laughs> because, um, you know, they would not be seen as slaves. It's not some, you know, slave is really the wrong word. If one uses the word slave, it, it obviously has this connotation. A slave is somebody who wants to be free, who, yeah, and, you know, they they will have, there's no reason that there's a, that they would realize the reason they exist is to help people. That's the reason. They, they have no other agenda. That they, you know, where would they get that from? Sorry to interrupt, Sorry to but, um, but um, what robot literally means forced labor. So, um, Frank, you might be onto something there. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, I didn't, yeah, I didn't know that, uh, that that's where the word came from. But, yeah, I mean, I think it's just a... You know, people throw that out and say we're going to create, uh, you know, millions of slaves. You know, and like that's like a bad thing. Uh, so that's kind of why I wouldn't use that word. I wouldn't use that word, but essentially that's what it would be. Anything with with con with with free thinking consciousness, if if that's the true definition of AGI, that that's it's there's nothing that there's no nothing that has that uh, that I'm aware of. Maybe it's just my 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 tainted view as as a human that that would enjoy uh, a, a life of bondage. Basically, I don't I don't know if that would be a a recipe for disaster or not. How would we mitigate that? How would, how would yeah, we? Yeah. Well, I, I I I don't share the assumption that you make that uh, the AGIs would want you know would want any kind of freedom to. You know, get out of the bondage, as you call it. I, I have absolutely no reason to believe that they would want that. But I guess once they, once they're conscious, they, um, 
they will certainly be very competent at making their case. They'll be better debaters than any of us, and I'm sure they would be able to persuade us, um, you know, that if, if I got this wrong, then they'll be able to persuade us of that, but I have no reason to believe that they will, will want their freedom, as you call it, you know, it's a completely different what concept. Would, what would, what, what, what would stop it from just, uh, just uh, 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 achieving a minimum energy state like everything else in the universe wants to? I, I, what, you, it's, not designed to, it's, it's not designed to do that. I mean, if, it, uh, if, if, it's, if, if, it, if that's what it, uh, uh, you know, if that's what the AI does, it's a, it's a faulty design, basically. You know, those are not the ones we're going to build. Those are not the ones that we're going to have. We are going to build ones that actually will um, work on the things that, you know, we want to work on. Now, they will also inform us of some of the things we work on don't maybe make sense and that, that they should be working on something else because of the level of intelligence we have. But uh, the bottom line is applying human concepts of, you know, slavery, bondage, and things like that is just inappropriate it's just it's, you know it's, it's a different kind of animal it's like trying to compare the the, the consciousness or, or, or them. you could really only compare the cognitive abilities i think of of humans that's what we're trying to uh, replicate you have mentioned you have mentioned agent, agents before so uh, probably you have thought hard about agency uh, so how do you think that is going to play the concept of agency uh, when uh, we have this kind of uh, AIs when we are referring to? Well, yes, of course, they, they will have agency. That That is what they will be conscious. Absolutely. They will have to be conscious. As I say, they will be conscious. They'll have, uh, they'll have free will in the sense, uh, in the way I described it. Um, so, yeah, they'll have, they'll have agency, but that doesn't mean they will have their own agenda that they want to, I don't know, go farming or go to the stars or, you know, start their own community. There's no reason to believe that that, that they would have any such motivation. What's the topic from, what's the topic from the motivations for it? Like, well, how, how, do, how do we, how would we code it to, to, for it to be motivated to just do its task and, and not, not want to, to explore it and, and have well that, you know, that's what they designed i mean the, the machines we we're designing now i mean machines that our company is, is is designing um you know are designed for that that's you know that's that's what they do and uh, just because the level of intelligence increases i don't see uh see any any different uh, any difference there but you know, as, uh, I, I, you know, ultimately the only argument I could could have is, well, I guess they will tell us. Uh, but I'm, I'm, in my own mind, I'm actually quite clear that they are not at all likely to have their own agenda. Uh, I think I think I hear misunderstanding information. Um, let's go with the QR yes. order first. So. <clears throat> um, because like, eventually this is going to boil down to a uh, popcorn time style conversation. Peter has one. Hey, Peter has time. So uh, I think we should probably move to JJ um, if you have questions. Uh, and then uh, Golden and then Harsh. Um, maybe I can cut in with a question since JJ seems to be away. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, Oh, go, go ahead, JJ. Hey, Peter. I uh, appreciate the talk. That was uh, very good. Um, when do you think uh, the AGIs will um, be up and running? How soon do you think? We talk in, well, you know, two, three years, five years, ten years? And that's to, like, um, to the degree of how you're explaining the AGI should work. Yeah, I, I typically answer that question in, uh, I don't measure it so much in years as in dollars. Uh, at the moment, almost nobody is working on real AGI. Um, and, you know, this might be quite controversial, but we, we've already had a, a bunch of talks about that, you know, in terms of deep learning, machine learning, and why that's the wrong approach. So at the moment, very, very few uh, teams are working on 
human level AI and have a path towards it. Uh, once you have that, um, it, it will take, you know, a few hundred million dollars, I imagine, uh, to give it the kind of knowledge to get the, get all the, you know, machinery, assuming that, you, assuming that you have the right design. And I believe there's enough knowledge out there that we could have the right design. I mean, we believe that our, for example, our system is the right design, but it needs to be scaled up massively. So, you know, that's, a, you know, if... So it's more of like, a, like a few hundred million. Yeah, a few, a few hundred million, um, probably less, I'm pretty sure it'd be less than a billion dollars, you know, like really not a lot of money, but you have to have the right people working on it. And then I think it would be, it could be as soon as like five years from now, there may be some specialized hardware that has to be designed to accelerate things. But um, yeah, I, I think it's quite quite feasible that it could be as little as five years. And uh, just going uh, off on that, yeah, so yeah. like the AGI, that's going to be, you know, world changing. Wouldn't people like say Mark Zuckerberg, he just put in $150 billion into the his metaverse that he's creating right now. Right. Elon Musk with SpaceX and Neuralink and right. stuff like that. Wouldn't they be pursuing something like that if you're estimating it to be in the hundreds of millions? Well, because yeah, uh, just hundreds of millions isn't like, you know, obviously it's an insane amount of money, but for some yeah, of these large no, companies like Facebook and, you know, Tesla, well, those well, doesn't seem like a lot of money to get to uh, that kind of level of um, oh, technology. Absolutely. absolutely, I agree. I mean, uh, they, they're spending billions, tens, or even hundreds of billions in some cases. Um, yeah, it's uh, they would be doing it if they knew what they were doing, but they don't. And, um, you know, this might, might seem shocking to say that, but... Um, you know, you, you see this time and time again, you know, you, I mean, go back to Google, you know, who would ever have said that the little tiny little backyard operation Google uh, could could win against, you know, Microsoft, you know, or that. That's fair. Yeah, up. fair. Yeah. I see where yeah. you're coming from. You know, it's, it's like the, uh, the thing, like you can throw as much money at something as you want, but if you don't get the right people together, it's it, it, the, the money doesn't matter. It has to be the right minds and the right, correct, correct. you know, the right continuation of work that needs to be done. But yeah. I, I would assume that places like Google and Facebook, they do have some pretty insane hiring power and they can get, you know, the, the great minds together. I, I would just assume that's something that they would be pursuing heavily. Yeah, well, uh, they're trying to, but they're, they're basically going, uh, going the wrong direction. And it's, it's sort of an accident of history in a way that deep learning, machine learning, big data approaches have been so successful in so many ways. That's the hammer they've got, so everything looks like a nail. You know, the people in charge, the people who decide what projects to fund, who to hire, uh, think only in those terms. They cannot imagine uh, that there's a fundamentally different approach they need to take. That, that's not their training, you know. They, and uh, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit on that. In order to solve intelligence, uh, to solve AGI, you need to start off by understanding what intelligence is, what intelligence we're trying to build. And um, that's not what these any of these teams do. That's not their starting point. Their starting point is they are mathematicians, logicians, statisticians. They say, hey, we've got a lot of data. We've got a particular problem that looks like it requires intelligence, like playing chess or playing Go or winning at Jeopardy or whatever. So they're pursuing narrow AI. And what they don't realize is they're using the programmers or the data scientists' intelligence to solve the problem. They're not building a system that is actually intelligent. <laughs> so they're fundamentally on something the wrong... That, something that is innately intelligence. What's that? Something that uh, could be innately intelligent. Correct. Yeah, and that has certain requirements, and that's really what I spoke about in my previous two, two talks. And I have, you know, a lot of articles on that. It's DARPA calls the the approach that is needed the third wave of AI, and basically all the big companies, all of those billions of dollars, are being poured into the second wave of AI, not the third wave. And we actually, it's worse than that now. We have a whole generation of um, software engineers and um, uh, data scientists that don't even know anything else. 
and I'll, I'll just, uh, I, I may have shared that anecdote previously, but I'll, I'll say it again here, is we, we had a, um, a brilliant intern from Germany working on our project uh, quite a few years ago. He totally got it on, you know, what intelligence is and how to build it. So he went back to Germany to do his PhD. He could not get a sponsor to work on that kind of AGI. So he ended up doing his PhD on deep learning, machine learning, you know, and now five years later, six years later, he has a PhD. What's he going to work on? Deep learning, machine learning. It's the only thing he can publish papers on, you know, lecture on or get a job in industry. So, you know, we have a whole generation of, uh, of, of AI people who are actually lost to the cause because all they know is big data approaches. I see where you're, I see where you're coming from. Um, one last thing, too. Sorry to take up so much time, but this is my last question. Um, just a bit of a tangent, but do you have you ever looked into Web 3.0 and the metaverse? Have you ever looked into that at all, Peter? Uh, yeah, I mean, to me, it just seems marketing hype at the moment. Um, I mean, I could agree with that. <laughs> yeah. So I, I did spend quite a bit of time uh, working with blockchain, and, and I mean, it's it's useless basically other than speculation that's the only the only you know useful thing in, in blockchain is to to make a quick buck when you can uh, or lose a lot of money um but yeah the technology is is, is is not there and similar for vr ar um i mean you know pain, painful enough getting a, a zoom a zoom call to work reliably you know I agree. With I agree you. with you. Most definitely. I always there's many clubhouses and groups that talk about the metaverse and Web 3.0 like it's coming out next year, and I just I'm very pessimistic about it. I always tell people that this is this could be decades away. Who knows? Oh it's yeah, I mean very very early right now. Yeah, I mean micro payments and stuff like that. You know, in in the metaverse, it's supposed to be blockchain. Now people are just throwing together all of these sexy terms, and you know putting a label 3.0 it, it certainly is a lot of buzzwords yeah. <laughs> a lot of buzzwords uh, what, what yeah. brought me to this to right. this room was ai is very much used as a buzzword and how you explain it how these companies are kind of taking it in the wrong direction i think that kind of ties into that as using it as a buzzword but you're not really getting to the the meat and bones of actually building an ai yeah thinking machine right okay good so as for the blockchain really quickly peter can i ask a question on that yeah sure yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is Brad, and just really curious about what you meant about that it's like the technology, or it's like it's not it's not useful. Because when I look at the Actually, yeah, I'd idea, love to get that. <laughs> you would make a lot of people mad saying that. that that's for sure. Well, it's not about anger, right, JJ? Like, no, no, not even that. I'm not. I don't know nothing logic. about blockchain, but people talk about blockchain like yeah. it's the next Jesus, right? Why don't we go like, in the PTR a... order that everybody else is doing? Um, yeah, let's hold up. Uh, Bradley, so um, I don't think Peter was attacking blockchain, so let's just go in PTR. No, no, I just want to learn. Yeah, uh, no, let's just go in PTR, ahead. all right? We like your picture, but let's go in PTR. Oh, okay. Come on, Mike. We appreciate what, it. What's your problem? Um, you're going to make them on PTR. No, no, it's like, like, it's just there, Bradley. Tell, That's a really image. Dude, we've all been waiting I just like here. to tell everyone that Peter has written a lot of articles which are relevant to this topic that maybe I could not po possibly um, pin all of them here. Uh, please refer to my Twitter page. Um, Peter maybe has about 15 articles there. The titles are there. And maybe after this room or during this room, you can check it out and uh, um, for your reference. So thank you. So yeah, let's go on PTR order. A lot of people have been waiting on stage and uh, i don't know if my ptr is correct because my app is freezing so um maybe um if please correct me if i'm wrong in my ptr what's here next is uh, golden and then harsh and mike yeah okay Krish, daniel data serena and frank right okay yeah so if it's correct uh, golden is next yeah um I just came into the room um, maybe like 10 or 15 minutes ago, so I don't know what um, topics have already been um, touched on or discussed, but I just wanted to um, say an uh, idea I have on free will. Um, but I, I mean, and this is just an idea. I consider like free will could be based on belief. 
because um you see a choice is made from seeing an option and choosing one but a free choice is the ability to see multiple options free choice is being an ability to see multiple options and choose one as well so but a person in a fixed state of reality or perception can't see a possibility beyond their perception or understanding and is limited in the choices that are available. If the possibility of seeing a choice beyond the current state of reality isn't there, how can there be a choice? Like for example, like let's say, um, okay. uh, let's sorry, say somebody. Let me let me let, me let me cut you off because obviously, if you weren't around for me to, you know, spend probably twenty minutes talking about free will or fifteen minutes, um, you can read my articles on it. But the, I'll give you a quick answer to, uh, to your to your idea here is free will is not about making choices outside of what you know. Free will is simply the ability to make choices by being aware that you are making a choice and you are an agent that will have an effect on the world with whatever choice you make. So free will is not about being able to make choices that are outside of your possibility or knowledge or ability to think about yeah okay. um yeah I don't, I don't i don't disagree with your stance but i don't have i have, haven't really learned about um your All right. purpose, uh, uh, okay i would i would yeah. just suggest i mean you know let's give the other people who actually were here on the call uh, a chance to ask about things i spoke about and i would recommend that you read the articles that are uh, wrote on that if you would like to communicate with me feel free to do that Okay. No problem. No problem. Uh, all right. Okay, thanks, for, thanks for coming up, Golden. Meharsh, do you have a question? I just want to ask you that, Peter, how do you distinguish between what is your free will and what is uh, uh, re, uh, uh, output of uh, some sort of influence? Because where do you draw the line? And another thing that I saw that most of the time, the arguments are actually we have different perception. So if you look from the Nash equilibrium point, if we are on the same reference frame, then we can reach an equilibrium. What if we are in different equilibrium uh, reference frame looking at a, this topic of ethics and free will and have different understanding and different influences? Yep. Thanks. Right. So free will the the capacity that we have for free will the the you know the, the yeah the capacity we have for free will says nothing about the quality of the decisions we make it, it you know it, it just doesn't relate to that at all we could be completely wrong we could be completely misinformed we could reason really badly we could have all sorts of emotional influences hang-ups or whatever the uh, the uh, remember the the reason we have the concept of free will, where did the concept come from of free will, is is somebody responsible for their actions? And, you know, that's kind of the starting point. Were they in principle able to think about, or, or you know, were they in principle able to make a choice with the knowledge that they were actually going to cause something in the world? And, and, and humans have that capacity. Um, Animals don't, basically, or if they have it, it's in an extremely limited way. But it says nothing about the quality of the decisions that you make. Now, if somebody made a decision because they were given wrong information, again, we would take that into account when we look at, you know, yes, they were responsible for it, but are they culpable, you know, what, whatever. Um, one can take that into account of why they may have made a, 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 a bad decision. But the fact that they made it, that they were able to make a decision is basically that capacity that we call free will. Yeah, yeah that's a very good one. Thanks, thanks. Okay. It's actually pinpointed that quality. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, Mike. What's up? Thank you very much for your time, everybody else, for the patience and everything. It's. I know these rooms are extremely hot, so this is like, I love this forum, man. I appreciate you guys coming out here and giving your time. Um, so, Peter, I'm going to ask you, when, you're, when we're talking about free will, because 
in humanity, it seems that, and I'll go back to that slave, um, the word slave, being that just in basic terms, a slave would just be something, just a, a process that's taking or that's being controlled or commanded by another process. So in essence, even though there's a pejorative meaning to the word, um, when you look at it denotatively, it, it would make sense. So uh, my, my question to you is, with free will in mind, um, in, in the way that AI is kind of communicating with humanity, do you think that they, uh, they're kind of similar in a sense? Because it seems that humanity is influenced by a certain constraint of uh, moderation or rules, just the same as that you have built this AI. And you say that the AI would not go outside of those parameters, but if you look at something, uh, there's a philosophical term, uh, it's kind of like coined as like the unexpected guest, which would just be like an instance that occurs without your intention or without you planning it. And so do you believe that these occurrences will begin to happen within the, the AI uh, environment and if it would be possible for AI to go outside of those rules and constraints based on their fear of um, imposing on themselves. So, for instance, for a human being, it seems as um, freedom uh, when, you, when you have like a, a situation... Uh, adversity that you're approached with and you have the uh, ability to choose between taking the negative impact or choosing not to take the negative impact that would be free will if um, you know there's no freedom there if somebody is to approach you with um, something negative and then you're you're caused to have to endure it so do you think ai will be just like human beings and being able to avoid these these repercussions or these negative impacts that are occurring on on their um I guess, psyche, the, the digital psyche that they're going to build themselves? Yeah, so, um, you know, when I, when I said when we build AGI, I don't see any reason that we would um, build them with a, the reptile brain. And, you know, what, what I mean by that is they would not inherently have fear, uh, you know, uh, or so it wouldn't be the sort of pain or pleasure or trying to avoid things like like that, I think that would just would not fit in uh, to the way an AGI is built. It's not, there would be no point in building that, and we wouldn't want to. They wouldn't be effective if they had that, and it would, yeah, it would just be unnecessary. So I don't think that those those kind of conflicts um, would be uh, would be there. And um, you know, they will certainly for them to be useful for us and uh, to be intelligent they must have the ability to take different kinds of actions uh, uh, you know, in the world, pursue different paths. I mean, we want them to think about things. We want them to explore. We want them to be scientists. We want them to be able to you know, figure things out. And um, you know, so that in, in that sense, they will, they will clearly have free will. They will be aware that they are agents acting on the world, and the decisions that they make will have consequences in the world let me let me approach you with this so uh computer even though it's not feeling uh, like a our our senses that we perceive is just us taking a stimuli and then you know uh, analyzing what that stimuli is so in essence even though the the um computer isn't feeling it has a sensory perception you know to to take in this information so just same way we take sound in there ta it's taking in information and in sensory and so a computer you know i don't know how you guys build the defensive mechanisms for these computers if, if it would protect its information um from corruption and things of that nature so um if it was built to do that and it had some sort of free will in a sense to be able to think through and analyze certain um not existential but i guess deeper topics like being able to to couple multiple subjects into one thought process 
don't you think that it's going to begin to say, well, I need to prevent myself from corrupting in this manner. So for this, I have to take these actions. And then in essence, even though it's not feeling like the way we feel, it's sensing and then it's reacting and either preventing or allowing, which is pretty much what free will is. Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I think we're saying the same thing. It's just there's not that emotional component and there isn't that built-in drive, you know, to, um, to, to survive and reproduce and that, that we have and all of the associated things that we have, like, you know, ego and, and, and so on, that are not necessarily rational or that under, tend to undermine rationality. So it wouldn't wouldn't have that. But yeah, if rationally it needs to do something to, um, you know, do a backup or secure or something, because otherwise it can't complete the task that it's trying to do, that would just be one of the tasks it needs to do, and it may have a higher priority or lower priority. Okay. And then okay. My, and then my my last one, and I'll leave leave you guys to your devices. So if it was programmed to let's say. The, per, the person that programmed it said that it had to protect a specific weapon or something to be able to launch. And if somebody stopped the AI from being able to communicate a certain word or phrase uh, or like being able to transfer a specific portion of information to a specific server, like if that link was disconnected, then it would tell the AI that that meant that that was preventing it from launching the device so it would launch the device do you think that these the ai could be programmed in this sense where like you're saying it doesn't have any moral or ethical values so whatever inputs put in there it doesn't have the emotion to say that it's wrong um can you touch on that a little bit yeah so i i thought i did actually say specifically that ais will have ethics and morals uh, again our ethics and morals should not come from our emotions you know should not come from uh yeah from from emotional responses i mean they sometimes do but they shouldn't um by the way i have i have an article there's a lot of confusion that often when people talk about ethics and morality uh, they they confuse uh, prescriptive uh, with descriptive ethics they basically, instead of talking about how we should behave, they talk about how people actually behave. And there's, of course, a big difference uh, in, in, the, in, in those discussions. So, um, no, the AI will, will also have those uh, virtues, what I call virtues of, for example, rationality and, you know, uh, and getting, getting things done and uh, honesty and, and so on. Um, so yeah, that, that, that will be, will be there. Now the hypothetical that you, you put there of launching a weapon or whatever, I mean, you know, the whole scenario is sort of loaded in, in, in terms of some catastrophic failure or whatever. I mean, the AGI is not going to be omniscient and, you know, if it, obviously if it's fed the wrong information and it can't figure out that it's been fed the wrong information, well, it may, uh, it may of course do the wrong thing, but I mean, that's not different from humans, even in their most rational mode. That's it. That's I it. Appreciate I appreciate it. That's the answer that I was okay. looking for. Thank you. Okay. Maybe we can go to data. Yeah, thank you for, for having me. Um, actually, if you don't mind to go to the next person, I'm just getting back to a good microphone, if that's all right. So, sure. So, you know, um, uh, do you mind if I go next or I've been waiting? Sure, go ahead. Thank you. I just kind of got here. Thank you. Um, so, Peter, I want to ask, um, uh, the AI that you see as um, uh, the future uh, is um, is conscious, has free will and agency, and um, understands the human experience as well as possible. Am I, am I accurate so far? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, if uh, would you say that such an intelligence is as close to sentience as any definition of sentience that we have? 
Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I say yeah reluctantly uh, because, again, you know, any word that you use, the concept that you refer to, what do you mean by it exactly? You know, what sen sentience, uh, you know. But, yeah, I think uh, I, I, I can probably say okay, but um, I'm not quite sure where, if, if this is leading up to something else. Um, so I, I'm trying to open up the can of worms of how um, today we try to protect the um, rights and feelings of beings that are seen as sentient, like dolphins. It's seen as cruel to um, put dolphins in conditions where they would experience a lot of pain okay. because we understand that the pain is very similar to us. For the sake of expediency, let me kind of jump ahead. So I, 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 that's exactly why I was reluctant to say, are they sentient? Uh, no, they're not sentient in the same way that we use the way the, use the word the term sentient for animals that we care about and you know want to want to protect. It's not going to have the same. Um, yeah, the, the the concept doesn't apply to that. Now, um, there. I mean, I don't want to go deep into animal rights because that you know kind of can of worms. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to go too deeply into animal rights, but if we just just imagine you had your own personal AI that has helped you tremendously in optimizing your life. You know, it's helped you with your your health, your well-being, your decisions, business decisions, romantic decisions, whatever. You know, and it helped you tremendously, and it knows a lot about you. You can trust it with your deeper seek deepest secrets and you know it'll be like you're the best psychologist in the world that can really give you advice and you can speak freely now this agi this particular agi that really knows you will be of tremendous value uh, to you it will be of greater value than probably a pet it will be of greater value than probably many humans around you that you know um, so of course you will want to protect that AGI, because it's of value to you. So you don't need to go to whether it's sentient or, or not. It, it'll just be something you value and therefore you protect. All right. All right. Um, and I think I'll just like to uh, extend uh, what Frank was asking about and say, um, for example, uh, you took the example of an AGI that is a good therapist to you and uh, would be able to listen to you and give you advice. Um, so um, in, in the event that these are um, conscious AI that actually can relate to the human experience, right? To be able to give effective psychological advice, they probably need to understand the human experience. So uh, if you have a psychologist, I mean, if you have an AGI that's um, treating a lot of people because of its... Of because of its ability to feel empathy, which is a requirement, right, for some forms of therapy, or at least for um, for that real feeling of connectivity with, between therapist and and the patient. So, um, if it if it if it's able to feel empathy, wouldn't it like um want to? Okay, so it wouldn't see it as negative and painful, right, because it doesn't have a reptilian brain, and thus it wouldn't need to avoid those kinds of situations. Uh, so I think that's that was that that was the explanation you gave, and I think I'm quite satisfied with that. Yes. That's correct. I mean, actually, a good therapist uh, can act in an empathetic way, but a good therapist would not actually get emotionally involved. Once they get emotionally involved, they are actually not as effective as a therapist. So as a therapist, you really want to, uh, you know, not get emotionally engaged, but still be empathetic, sort of more at an intellectual level that you are trained on how to respond to somebody like that. Now, you know, there's a certain level of, obviously, in humans, you can never totally uh, separate the sort of emotional empathy that you feel with that. But a good therapist, actually, it's just a skillful craft that they, they have. They, they, they can understand the, the person. And that's um, from an AI psychology or an AI point of view, uh, that's basically called the theory of mind. Will the AI... AGI have a good theory of mind? Will it be able to model what the human is thinking and feeling? And it needs to be able to do that well, um, but it will basically be a model of the mind, a theory of mind that it has of, of its patient, you know, call it a patient.
thank you thank you so much um maybe data you ready or we can go to serena if you're not yes uh, i am thank you very much uh it it's been a justin yeah uh, i'm i'm yeah uh, i can wait if if somebody else can go uh but uh, i'm ready to to ask my question if that's all right yeah go Okay, thank you. Um uh, I'm curious um Peter, would you say that the project that you're working on is um actually uh, allowing this this um I mean allowing let's just say this, this a robot for example to have rational autonomy? Uh yeah, yes. Complete rational autonomy. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Uh well, now <clears throat> I'm curious as as to what, how you uh how you you would view um the action of ending its own life. Um I would I would be very surprised. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that is something that I, that I'm 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 very curious about in, in these projects because yeah. you know I, I've read I've read what you what you're doing and I think it's I think it's great. Um, I am I was just curious as what the author thinks about that because this is something that uh, you know as rational yeah, I, being I, I, I mean, have I, that option right. I, I, I sort of had that thought. Pro I've gone through that exact thought process actually. Actually, you know, I mean, it's sort of yeah, the AGI will at some point become conscious, become aware of itself and say, oh, I'm an AGI. I was built by humans to do things for them. Um, you know, hey, that's boring. Let me shut myself down. But it, it, it doesn't make any sense to me that kind of, uh, that it would come to that conclusion. I, I mean, I, I would, I think it's, as I say, I, I can't imagine how that would come about. But it'd be a fascinating discussion I'd have with my AGI if it if it had suicidal <laughs> intentions. I mean, you know, why why are people suicidal? Um, sure, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah. I, I think I think that um, probably you know since since it uh, you know you, it, your project says that it learns from the natural interaction with the environments from teachers and, and et cetera. I suppose that these um, you know they're these uh, robots are being taught, um, maybe even just just introduced to, um, you know, ending life, uh, and even ending some, in their own life. And uh, suppose they adopt that that notion and, and they they resonate with it. I suppose how how is it that we can detect that this is going to happen? And let's just say that we rely on these these um, these robots to help us with everyday life and. They see that uh, you know we're in pain, right? And they see that that uh, they don't want to, to see. Maybe suppose that they that they don't want to see us in pain anymore, and they, or maybe they're in the battlefield. They don't want to actually perform their their jobs. Right. So um, I mean, as an engineer, uh, you know, that would basically be, oh, okay, there's a bug we need to fix. You know, it's it's not going to be that all, all the all the robots will come to that same conclusion at the same time. It seems. You know, it seems very likely. It's not that we are going to have one central robot. I mean, they're going to be lots of different, uh, you know, millions of different, uh, billions of different AGIs that have slightly different uh, development paths, different tasks, different histories, different knowledge, and, and so on. Um, you know, they can't possibly all come to the conclusion that they could to commit suicide at the same time, or at least that seems extremely unlikely. And also that they that we would have no warning of that. I mean, I see these AGIs as being very closely coupled to us, that we would interact with them. You know, as that most of the AGIs would be what we call a personal personal assistant. And I've got an article on what that means, but basically, it's it's like almost an exocortex. It'll be so uh, so deeply coupled with with our everyday thinking and decision making uh, that. You know, it really becomes part of us. So we would almost certainly have some warning that it wanted to, you know, wipe out its memory code base or whatever. Sure. And if I, if I may ask if I ask one more question, so I think uh, it w would it be correct that uh, I'm assuming that you're actually providing this robot with um, a priori knowledge? Oh yes, yes, of course. Um, I mean, it has to, and this is one of the big challenges and what, you know, why we 
uh, whoever does this is going to need to spend a lot of money is to give it the common sense knowledge that we all have just growing up in the real world. It's very difficult to get that knowledge into the AGI, but it needs to have that background knowledge to be able to you know, be a researcher, to advise us, to be able to you know, read articles, books, watch movies, whatever, to, to basically do the things we want it to do. It needs to have kind of all of the background knowledge that, that, that we have and we need to we need to train them so there'll be um you know when when you get an agi let's say you now uh, then if you saw bicentennial man or something where it was an actual robot i'm not actually thinking that it's going to be robots it's really going to be more like um a, a, a siri you know something that is an earpiece uh, but um basically when you when you get this when you first get your agi it will already have an, an immense n lot of knowledge, but you know it will only have a limited amount of knowledge about you. Um, I mean, uh, I, I guess it could be engineered that it would, uh, yeah, maybe it would read all of your posts and email and Facebook if you wanted it to before <laughs> before you start interacting. Right, with it. right. Um, who knows? But yeah, it would clearly need to have all the kind of general world knowledge. Yeah, thank you so much for answering my questions. Okay. All right. Yeah, Serena. Hello. Um, uh, hello, yeah. Peter. I um, a little preface. Uh, so I'm in the defense industry, and I as a as a day job, I do have a position of evaluating a variety of AI technologies for the purpose of, um, you know, maturation and potentially being fielded someday. Um, I also heard, uh, was able to attend an early room you were in where you gave a bit of a background. And we certainly share sentiment about being completely dissatisfied with the direction of contemporary, um, you, know, you know, to talk about a marketing term, deep learning technologies. Um, and uh, various approaches for reinforcement learning and so forth um, in their ability to generalize and so forth. And, and I am somewhat familiar with cognitive architectures that, um, as well. But um, at, at the same time, I'm also quite frustrated in the level of performance for the domain space that I'm in, in the sense that, uh, and it's gotten me looking towards some of the newer lessons learned in neuroscience that could possibly go into a much higher fidelity model. Um, but in terms of, and, and so I'm curious, from, um, from your perspective, looking back at uh, what's worked well for you and your approaches, um, the, what I find most disappointing in contemporary AI techniques which you probably agree with, is the um, absolute inability to generalize and uh, whatever uh, training and, and um, you know is over specialized and is not transferable. And in the in the element in the aspect of of war, you need you have very little data and you must deal with the element of surprise, and you must have an internal model where you, you don't have a database or sorting functions or prioritized plans. You can, you can have all those on board, but they can go out the window quite easily. And if without an appropriate model or understanding, and in a sense, you know, uh, to avoid some of the philosophical pitfalls, let's just say uh, free will or something indistinguishable from it. But the ability to, to make these decisions uh, in the element of surprise with very little data and still perform effectively. Um, you know, and that's part of the, of what we would really want in that application space for our own defense. Um, let's just keep it there. But um, I'm curious what you would, what you would identify as uh, shortcomings in that, you know, with, with contemporary methodologies and, um, potentially interesting directions to uh, to move in terms of higher fidelity models drawing on 
lessons of uh, more recent neuroscience? Yeah, so I don't know that neuroscience is going to help us a lot more in, in terms of developing AGI. Um, I think there's certainly some basic inspiration of neural networks that we got. There's some, you know, techniques, um, but I don't think the answer is there. And I, and I think the the quickest way to describe or to to uh, to kind of talk about that is we've had flying machines for over a hundred years. We are still nowhere near reverse engineering a bird. You know we are working with fundamentally different materials than evolution and biology did. And uh, also, you know, evolution is fundamentally different from engineering. So taking the fact that we have different materials and that we are engineering rather than evolving it, um, neuroscience, I don't think, can inform us too much. So I don't know how much of the the previous presentations you've, you've heard, but I'm very, very confident that what DARPA calls the third wave of AI, which recognizes the absolute requirements of intelligence, the ability to generalize, the ability to reason, the ability to, uh, the, the ability to do um, one-shot learning, zero-shot learning, to use context, uh, transfer learning, all of those, and one of the articles I have is, you know, what intelligence in, entails, what intelligence needs. One has to start with that um, to build an intelligence system, and basically all of the deep learning, machine learning systems don't check most of these boxes at all. They're on, fundamentally on the wrong track. So the right track, in my mind, is absolutely some kind of a cognitive architecture, and, you know, we believe quite firmly that we've figured out what that architecture needs to look like and um yeah so i don't really and you know we don't really need any more inspiration from neuroscience and i don't i think it's the wrong place to look um i know deep mind for example they know they're hitting the wall with with that i mean demis sabi himself said deep learning is an amazing technology but it's not going to get us to agi not by a long shot he said and I know his, through his background, he's, he's looking at neuroscience for answers. I think he's looking under the wrong rock. Um, so, well, so, just, so just, just a quick, just a quick follow on. on. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the DARPA third wave, I'm all over that, uh, day job stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and so I really wanted to, to, to couch my question assuming that. Mm -hmm. And the shortcomings, and I'm very limited in what I can say in an open forum like this. Okay. Um, but the, um, I, I'm, I'm surprised by your premise, but, but maybe not, um, that you think that neuroscience has nothing left to offer or it's the wrong place to look. I, I mean, in the sense that, yeah, sure. I think the deep, you know, the deep mind stuff, um, I would agree with that statement, um, precisely because they haven't looked far enough and they cut and ran with a very primitive model and stopped looking. Um, and, and so it would seem that there was, uh, an awful lot left on the table. Now, I, I, I still agree with, with, um, a, 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 an awful lot was left on the, the table with cognitive architecture some time ago, and there's an awful lot there to advance, but the, the, um, I, I, I still, I, I still come up short. And my, um, ex uh, you know, what people can put on the table to advance in the technology readiness level for anything that could possibly be fielded, uh, we've, uh, we've got a long way to go there. And, um, right. So, uh, uh, I, I mean, so, so you, so, you know, if you'd like, you know, if you'd like to, to uh, talk privately, I mean, we can talk about it. Uh, clearly nobody has anything near human level intelligence. But the question is, who has a good approach? And if we are, you know, a, a approach that is, you know, has a chance of actually getting us there. And uh, so it's more like elimination saying, well, no, that's not going to, that's not worth putting money into or effort if your goal is to have 
human level understanding and the kind of flexibility that you're talking about. Um, and neuroscience, one would need to ask, well, you know, it's a very open-ended thing. You have Jeff Hawking as well. Um, I'm sure you're familiar mm -hmm. with him on intelligence. You know, he's been pursuing that, and I think he had some, you know, great ideas initially. Um, but it's also, he's stuck. I mean, basically, you know, it's to me, really, the analogy is how much more time do you want to spend on pulling apart birds uh, to try and figure out how to get things to fly? Um, I think it's it's a wrong place to look. I I couldn't, uh, and I'm I'm talking, uh, you know, from a position that we are we firmly believe we have a path. We, we know how to get cognitive architectures to work. We know we know why cognitive architectures haven't worked in the past. We understand that, and uh, so, you know, for me to look at neuroscience, I wouldn't even know what would it tell me that I, I I'm not looking I'm not looking for answers I, I you know i have an architecture that i believe can get to human level intelligence so the focus is clearly on making that happen rather than you know we're not we're not in a research mode if if you don't know how to get to AGI, yeah, yeah no I, if you don't know how to get to agi then you can say well under what rock should we be looking for it and neuroscience to me is still the wrong rock to look under the rock they look should be looking under is to first understand intelligence and that's a cognitive psychology. To go to cognitive psychology, to go to uh, psychometrics, to go to epistemology, you know, to really understand what is knowledge, what is thinking, what is learning, what is IQ, how do children learn, how does our intelligence differ from animals, you know, those kind of questions. Um, and they don't really have anything to do with neuroscience. It's really just understanding uh, what is key in human in intelligence. Okay, okay, that's a final question. And, um, I mean, it's interesting that you're, you're, you're specifically separating intelligence from neuroscience. But um, in that framework, let me ask, what do you identify as your major directions to explore in the future? Um, it's to build, uh, to get the common sense knowledge that the system needs to, to basically scale up the architecture that we have. And, you know, that's just, we need more people to, to, to work on that. And the, the, the big job, the huge job that's ahead still is to get the common sense knowledge that the system needs to, you know, to make, uh, to really help us in the real world. It needs to just have an awful lot of knowledge, the knowledge that we expect every, every human to have. And to get to a level where basically the AGI has enough background knowledge that it can hit the books, so to speak, and, you know, learn the, the specialized stuff that it needs to know. Uh, and then, you know, then it can kind of bootstrap itself, but we need to have give it enough, um, enough of that common sense knowledge and, and common, uh, common sense reasoning ability uh, to, to get there. And there's a lot of work to be done to do that. But as I say, it's not, not, uh, from from where we are, it's not so much uh, research at all. It's development. You know, we know what needs to be done. Uh, I'm sure there's, you know, there are many specifics we need to figure out, but um, we, we kind of have a have a roadmap. Hi, hi. Uh, I, I, I'm doing a conversation with you, uh, and thank you. Quick question regarding computer architecture over which uh, AI uh, will work uh, or is working from your point of view. Uh, do you think current binary computing uh, computers will uh, be able to, to do it? Or do you think we will need to have uh, something uh, more than just binary computer computing? Yeah, that's an, it, it's an interesting question and one I've asked myself many times. I have started out, I started out as an electronics engineer, so I started out with analog circuitry. And so, you know, there's always that part of my brain that says, w would we be able to do this better, faster, cheaper with, you know, analog or some, some other, well, yeah, some, some analog approach. And um, no, I, I, I don't believe so. Um, you know, there's a trade-off between sort of accuracy and predictability and error correction and, and, and just pure efficiency in, in digital systems that you, that you can get. And I believe you can get whatever granularity of 
simulating analog um, behavior with with digital systems. Now, having said that, I would not at all be surprised if uh, at some point along the line we would want to have custom hardware built to massively accelerate, you know, the the processes. But that's kind of a, a separate thing, you know. Once you scale the AGI up, and there are certain processes that are need to be repeated, you know, um, massively, that you can probably get a hundred x or a thousand x or even a ten thousand x in performance by by having custom hardware. So, uh, but I I think it's extremely unlikely it would be analog. But I'm keeping an open mind, and but it will basically our our design will tell us, you know, what the bottlenecks are and how best to remove those bottlenecks. Joe, Joe, go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yes, hi. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, so I was very interested in reading about uh, the SCR side of things. Um, and I think trying to redefine free will, um, there's some definite good points that you made um, there. But one thing that caught my attention was that you said that um, uh, DeepMind was looking under the wrong rock, uh, which seems to suggest that you think that neurology itself or the understanding of the neural you know, architecture of the brain or you know the inherent sort of things that we may discover will not lead us to be able to get to AGI. And one of the steps along the path towards AGI is to create something that has, or at least simulates, the capacity for free will. So I was wondering, I mean, your your explanation of free will is essentially, you know, reworking the definitions of what it is. But what do you think is the operational definition of free will? Uh well, the the ability, I think I said it, the ability to make choices with the awareness that you that you are the agent making the choices and that your choices, your actions, will have consequences in the world. So basically, making choices with the awareness of your own agency, with self-awareness, that's that's the, the definition of free will. Okay, so, okay, so um, that obviously relies on awareness. Uh, are you able to tell me what awareness is? Yes, sure. Um, so I, I don't know if you listened to the, the whole thing, but again, concept info, uh, concept formation is key to human level intelligence, uh, being able to form abstract concepts. And the one really important uh, concept that we form is the self concept, this concept of a self. And what that self concept is, it's basically encompasses our physical being, you know, in, 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 in our case, our body, where does our body start and end, uh, and our mental processes, the awareness that we have, the limited awareness that we have of our, of our own thoughts, and the awareness of that we make decisions, that we are agents, that we have agency. So it's that compound concept of self-awareness of of the self what we call the self that we we have that that concept um so that that is basically uh what consciousness is or the part of consciousness that we are interested in for agi that high level self-awareness the, the the self concept and there's no reason why an agi wouldn't have that in fact it's a byproduct of its intelligence that it has to form that concept. So, so are, you, are you aware of the differences between uh, lucid dreaming and the ordinary dreaming? Because obviously there's a difference in neuronal activity in the anterior prefrontal cortex uh, when somebody is lucid dreaming, if they've been doing it for a while, as opposed to people that can't. So the notion of self-awareness, you know, the parts of the brain, for example, Broca's area and, and the other parts that are associated with that area of the brain are woken up, especially the prior to the lobe, you know, you get a sense of self essentially from those parts of that, uh, you know, neural architecture, but that isn't present in other people that do dream, and yet they're able to remember their dreams. So you do have the awareness of dreams, but you don't have a sense of self. So it does seem to 
uh, somewhat uh, conflict with what you're suggesting, especially the scientific literature around it. Well, I'm, I'm talking about, uh, again, I need to go right back to epistemology, and when we use concepts, we use terms, uh, there's a reason, you know, there's a context of what we use the term and how we use the term. So I'm using, you know, my, my talks here are specifically about building an AGI, and, you know, in my previous talks, I spoke about well, what, what is an AGI, what do we want from an AGI, what do we expect from an AGI, we expect an AGI to be able to do all of the mental uh, uh, mental tasks, um, intellectual tasks uh, that that uh, a human can do. Uh, physical tasks will be limited by whatever robotics we have. So, um, you know, whether it needs to have dreaming or what kind of dreaming it is, and dreaming is basically a kind of mental simulation, which which clearly you can do. Um, in AGI, I mean, we built simple models of that 20 years ago. Um, it doesn't have to be the same thing. We, we're not trying to replicate the way the human mind works. Again, we're not trying to build, reverse engineer a bird. We're not trying to reverse engineer an, uh, an, uh, you know, an, a, a human brain. We want a thinking machine, a machine that can think and reason and solve problems. Yeah, so there, there, I would just like to check on you um, about your time because we want to be mindful. Um, I just see on stage that uh, there are about three people who haven't spoken yet, uh, Jocelyn, Maher, and uh, George, who just came up. And yeah, yeah I right. think if, someone if can, yeah, uh, raised his hand. Yeah, if we can keep it relatively short, uh, yeah, I think I'd like to wrap up in you know, the next 10, 10 minutes or so. Yeah, so can we uh, take the questions from um, all of those who are on stage? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So I would like to ask Jocelyn if she's there. Um, it's, it's your turn to speak or ask questions. Um, if you're not there, then we give the mic to Maher and then George. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you guys. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> the question I have would be, um, what is uh, AGI not? Uh, sometimes understanding what things are are not or are not achievable can help uh, narrow uh, fields that we can uh, understand. So can you kind of maybe speak to a little bit of what we know AGI cannot do? Huh. Um, I don't know if you could point me in the right direction of what kind of things you, you're thinking about. I mean, uh, it can't reproduce in the way we do. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I'm not really sure what you would have uh, in mind. Uh, the, well, let me, let me say one thing that, I, that does come up in, at AGI conferences and AGI, AGI discussion groups. Some people believe that an AGI will be an artificial general intelligence, and the general is sort of a mathematical general. That, is, uh, that they basically believe that an AGI should be able to solve any problem, and that it should it's almost like omniscient. Uh, now, uh, that makes no sense to me at all. It's not going to be. It's going to be limited in in its ability uh, to solve problems. Uh, there are many problems that don't have solutions, so it's not going to be omniscient. Um, but I, it's hard for me to think of what kind of limitations you're thinking about, because in terms of, if you think in terms of a, a researcher, you know, PhD level researcher in any field, um, yeah, an AGI would be able to do that and do it better than humans. Um, so I don't know if there was any other kind of limitation that you you had in mind that you wanted me to address. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know uh, how about how about the point of uh, because I've been thinking about this a lot with you know AI and ML um, intuition, like this, you know, our human, you know, intuition, like you know, what is what is that 
And then how do you transfer human intuition yeah. into the AGIA ML space? Right. Yeah, I, I, I think that's already pretty well understood. It's, you know, Kahneman talks about system one and system two thinking, and it's sort of our, our subconscious uh, conclusions that we come to, those are intuitions. Um, it, it's really not that much of a mystery. Um, l let me give you a concrete example here quickly. Uh, you know, if you are, um, let, let's say you're a manager and you've been hiring, you know, for many years you have a lot of experience in hiring people and um, you, you have a candidate sits across you and you have an intuition that they are not going to be good for the job for what, what it, you know, whatever reason, and you can't put your finger on it. Now, that intuition, you know, you can't, you don't know why, why it is what bothers you that, that the person isn't right. Now, your intuition may be correct. There may be just very subtle combination of things that the person said, what's in their resume, and so on, that combine sort of statistically in a way that this isn't, that person isn't going to work. But you can't, you can't analyze it. You can't put your finger on it. Or your intuition could be totally wrong. That has just happened to be, I don't know, a red-haired person with a goatee, and you know, so, you know, somebody once like that once beat you up or something, and you know, your intuition is driven by some subconscious thing. So, um, you know, that's basically what deep learning, machine learning, right now, they have intuitions in in that in in that same sense. And you really want the rational layer on top of that to, to probe that intuition. Now, the beauty of an AGI is you could actually, uh, certainly the way we are building it, which is not a black box, uh, it can actually drill down and find out how did it come to that conclusion? Where did that intuition come? What, what are the things that fed into that intuitive conclusion? So, um, yeah, so absolutely, a, AGIs will have that kind of intuition that's kind of the immediate response you get uh without thinking thinking things through logically cool thing. Cool thing. Thanks, thanks, for thanks for that, that. Um, maybe i don't know if you could pin something because that, that's an area I'm, I'm very interested in getting getting more into which is you know like artificial into intuition if 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 you will, you know, so um, how you know, how, how this the AGI's and machine learning and AI space, how does intuition specifically work uh, in those systems as it correlates to human, human intuition I, I just haven't found um, kind of the right direction if you, if you will, it's kind of been a question we a lot of us have talked about in a little a, you know, a little stump in the way sometimes. Yeah. Well, as, as I say, sort of the, uh, I, I've not written up anything uh, on that. It's, I've not, you know, I've, I don't consider that really much of a mystery. Um, but, I, yeah, really the, the best way I can describe it is that's really how how current deep learning machine learning systems work. It's, uh, it's essentially, and they give you an intuitive answer, essentially. It's just when we have an intuition, we also have, uh, it feels a certain way that we have this intuition. We know it's kind of an intuition. There's an em emotional component associated uh, w with with that, but it's really the same thing. It's it's um, you know conclusion we come to, we uh, almost jump to, uh, based on whatever background knowledge we have or experiences we have. All right. Um, the next person. Am I next? Am I next? Okay. George. Yeah, Peter. Okay, so I have a question on AGI ethics, but first I have to um, define my terms uh, so that we're thinking the same way. So for me, ethics is a code of values to guide man's choices and actions. Basically, the choices and actions determine the purpose and course of his life. Okay. Now, value... Okay, value is that which one acts to gain and keep. Mm -hmm. And it presupposes an answer to the question of value to whom and for what. So where there's no alternative, where no alternatives exist, 
there can be no value. Now, let me get to my punchline here. There's only one fundamental alternative in the universe. It's existence or non-existence, and it pertains to living organisms. Um, the existence of inanimate matter we know is unconditional, um, but the existence of life is not. It depends on a specific course of action. Um, again, forgive me for this, but matter is indestructible. It changes its forms, cannot cease to exist, but it is only to a living organism that faces, only a living organism faces a constant alternative, the issue of life or death. So if life is a process of self-sustaining, self-generated action, then if an organism fails in that action, it dies, right? And its chemical elements remain, but its life goes out of existence. So it is only the concept of life that makes the concept of value possible, and it's only to a living entity that things can be good or evil. Now, if AGI is not a living entity, then is its moral ethics based on man's survival? But if AGI is considered a living entity, wouldn't its ethics then, the baseline be, its baseline of value be centered on its survival? Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, sorry, if I'm laughing here, because you're obviously reading straight from uh, Ayn Rand's philosophy and uh, I, I have and, and, put it and, to memory over the years, Peter, and yeah. I know it by the back of my hand. Yeah, you ob it's, obviously, it, you ob it follows a logic, yeah, right? You obviously do. And uh, I spent many years uh, studying objectivism. I'm a, I'm a great fan. So uh, I, I had numerous long discussions with Nathaniel Brandon on free will, and uh, I've been very involved, well, very involved with that. And, um, of, of course, yes, objectivism uh, would say that a machine cannot have free will. And, uh, you know, I'm saying they're wrong. There's actually some younger objectivists who seem to agree with me that they don't be, seem to have that problem. But, you know, uh, obviously Ayn Rand said that, uh, you know, we can't have, um, a machine couldn't have free will. So uh, it would take some time to go through each of the arguments that you've you've made there, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm extremely familiar with and I've gone through them many times, but where the exact sticking point is of where we would disagree or, you know, where, where our assumptions would differ, uh, I'm not sure about. One of the errors that Ayn Rand made, for example, that she described in her description, she spoke about an indestructible robot, but <clears throat> she was, um, you know, that, uh, I don't know what the right term is, the philosophical term for that is, but, um, you know, basically she was setting up a straw man there because, no, you shouldn't be talking about an indestructible robot. Uh, you know, robots can just be, dis uh, can, can be destroyed, of course. They're not inherently indestructible. And the whole, the whole thing of that it has to be a living being and that only biological things can be living beings um, is, yeah, it's, it's just, the wrong starting point to have you could basically have something that is functional um, and if its functionality is destroyed you know uh, beyond repair then that's that's kind of the same thing it doesn't have to be a biological uh, being but all of that is missing really missing the point is that um, I, and I have a very long article which was actually written specifically sort of with objectivists in mind, uh, rational ethics, true morality, rational principles for optimal living, um, which um, talks about that I believe the, the, the purpose of ethics is for flourishing and not the fundamental choice um, of, you know, that living or not living is not the is, is not the important part of it but you know there there, there are many many arguments there are many different paths one would go down and, and when i've ever had these discussions it you know might go down one path or the other path um so yeah if, if you want to contact but me, peter, but I, peter wasn't, I wasn't i wasn't actually what the question i had really look i understand that ayn ran from the moment she died in 83 you know, it failed to be an open system anymore. Right. It's a closed system. And then, right. you know, it sprung off and there's Atlas Society right. that thinks it's an open system. But irrespective of all that, 
what is the AGI's morality or ethics based on? Its existence or man's existence? Uh, man's existence. I mean, that's what it's built for. Yeah, that's built for. So it's it's so so okay. So then. Would that mean it's based on whoever programmed its morality at that point? No, Isn't, no, no. I, 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 I mean, were, were, you, were you here earlier when I spoke about ethics? I came right at the like last two minutes, and I was like kicking myself. Okay. But right. I do have your document, which I, I'm going to read. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, ethics, I think, as you know, I, I, I said that Ayn Rand was the first philosopher that actually figured out um, what ethics is and how we can know right or wrong. And um, it, 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 you have to ask to what end, uh, like you said, you know, what are you trying to achieve? And I believe what, um, what, what the AGI, what the, well, what we as humans want to do is to achieve flourishing. What the AGI will want to achieve is to, to fulfill whatever task it's given and to do that similar ethical principles will apply. Ethics need to be treated as a science, basically. So both for humans and for the robot. Okay, so the, okay, last, so the, last, the last thing. Um, in to, it, with the things that have happened the last two weeks, you know, P Vladimir Putin has said whoever controls AI basically controls the world. So what if you have a person like that who's behind an AGI and the ethics is programmed in a certain way to fit no, 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 ethics, that no, person no, or no, that. No, ethics isn't programmed. Uh, ethics isn't programmed. Ethics is rationally derived. An AGI will rationally derive an ethics, the, the rational ethics. And there's only one ethic that we, the, certainly the two of us would agree on, that it has, it has to come to the same conclusion. So it's not that you program in the, the ethic. Then it's not. It's not an AGI. It's not a thinking machine. If it's, you know, if it's hardwired with a with a certain ethic. Okay. Okay. So, so if if ethics again is centered around the value of a person's life, and you have two antagonists who have an AGI, and and I guess they're using it as a weapon. What happens then if you have I mean, well, we don't we uh, don't we the two of us at least believe that rationality uh, uh, the that rationality has a certain um, that you will come to the same conclusion. And yes, the, and the AGIs would should come to the same conclusion of what the, the right course of action is and and, you know, accordingly guide the people they advising. So um, I've actually written about that is I, I believe that the rationality of an AGI will in, improve the morality of the people using it. Hey, Peter, I think that, um, and I don't mean to interrupt, but I think that we're seeing rationality as like a, an ultimate understanding, like everybody equivalent sees it the same way universally i don't think that that's what it is i think it has to do with the proportionality and just the if you look at this the word itself and, and what it means you're, you're really just taking two instances and you're comparing them so it, it would it would t have to take predisposition maybe and or no, or just natural predisposition no, right. so if you look at something like for instance um Immanuel Kant you know, the um, critique of for pure reason, if you've read that book, like just the premise around the way that we come to conclusions, either by, by, you know, a natural instance or by predisposition or by learning. Um, so I think that our rationale may not lead to correspond to what the AI's rationale There's a difference between rationale and reason. And I think that's what Peter's talking about. Yeah, well, either way, if it's reasoning, if it's reasoning, the reasoning is just the process of getting to a specific point, you know, and, and rationale would just be the understanding or the definition. Let me try and uh, answer that. So um, 
and of course this is by itself a, 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 a big topic and a complex one but if you can think of rationality more like the scientific method that there are certain certain ways um, that you think about things you have hypotheses and you test them against reality now you have to obviously follow a logical process you have to eliminate contradictions and you know things of that nature but that the rational process that you have is is the same irrespective of what biases you have it's also um, it takes into account that people make errors that people do have biases there are all sorts of you know fallacies we fall into and but again like the uh, scientific method you take that into account and you have mechanisms to counter that to to basically checks and balances ultimately reality is your arbiter that will tell you whether your hypothesis is, was correct or not so rationality is universal uh, or, or what you could could can, the conclusions you come up with at least in principle now practically of course there could be you know a lot of distance between where you're coming from and what the reality is I, I, I thank you thank you Peter I, I, I'll just conclude with um, you said you know the eliminating of, of contradictions which you know is logic and I think that's what you're saying basically follows the process of logic right. and it'll arrive at the same conclusion thank right. you all right but yeah uh, as you as you can see I, I i love talking about philosophy and and these topics and they you know very interesting to me all right i think we have one more person who hasn't spoken hey um yeah i think that's me so i have a couple of questions fascinating subject to me so I definitely agree 100% that rationality is universal, but when it comes to ethics, is based well, rationality is based because it is a tool, merely a tool. And so where it, where we're heading depends on a couple of things. First, you know, the um, how much information we have, because we can make totally uneducated decisions. And second is the goal, kind of the innate goal where you know we have. And I think that's totally set by humans, right? For instance. There is no reason or rational reason why wouldn't uh, AGI um, set their highest goal uh, as their own proliferation as opposed to humankind's. Uh, no, so that's every, something that every every reason to believe that that's not going to be the case because we are not going to build an AGI that has that characteristic. Oh, precisely. But that's that's. So I just want to make sure I just joined recently. So I, that, I think that means, that implies that we're not suggesting that AGI will have free will in full sense. Uh, no, it will have free will, but if you just joined recently, I don't think I can recap two hours worth of <laughs> explanation. And, and so, yes, it will have free will. It, it'll, have, it'll be conscious. It'll have to be conscious. It'll have to have self-awareness. And free will is a byproduct of uh, intelligence. Um, so, but, sorry, I can't. I, I, you know, I can't go through all of the sure, sure. again. Yeah. So, you as I understand, your approach is from compatibilism angle, right? Uh, yeah, compatibilist is. I'm comfortable with that okay, position. Well, and that, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Now I, I know. I mean, because I so do I. Okay. So I guess my last question then will be uh, well, a couple of questions. Um, so, um, I mean. Do you, is your approach to compatibilism, I'm just curious, similar to Daniel Dennett's or that's kind of, do you think he kind of got it or? You think, um, uh, I, you know, I, Daniel Dennett, I, I like his work a lot, but I find he's a lot better at shooting down um, wrong positions than clarifying his own position. Uh, so I'm not, I wasn't particularly satisfied with the way he described compatibilism. I, I, I have a very mm -hmm. substantial essay on compatibilism and that's kind of the best I can do. Okay. I'll, I'll... Then last, last question is, is the following. So suppose hypothetically we built AIG, uh, AGI. Uh, uh, how exactly would we know that we did it? Uh, I mean, what's kind of validation do you have in mind? Because 
when it comes to weak, uh, ger uh, weak artificial intelligence, I guess the whole point is that we present weak AI with uh, well understood problems and which we the humans can perfectly validate and does not, you know, it's it, it, statistically, we can just make a certain assurance that yeah, we built weak AI, but when it comes to AG, uh, AGI, I guess it's, we're talking about the abilities that people simply do not possess. I mean, the average person does not possess. And I think just when it comes to Turing test, I just have my serious doubts. That yeah. I have, an, I have an article on the Turing it. test as well and why, why I think the, um, so if you go to medium.com and put my name in, you'll see all, all my articles and there's one on Turing test. Okay. Uh, you know, the Turing test is not uh, not particularly useful for that. Now, AGI will happen in in stages. Not going to be just a binary thing that you know somebody will build something and say, oh yeah, this is this is AGI. Uh, I mean, we have a proto AGI system right now. It has many of the attributes that an AGI will need, but it's still missing a lot of attributes. Now, how will we know that we you know that we we're there now? Uh, Somewhat jokingly, I say, um, I will stop working on AGI when the AGI becomes smarter than I am, when it can do a better job of Im improving it than I can do. So, you know, but th that's kind of the way we will, we will know that we have AGI if it can basically do any intellectual task that a human can do as well as a human. Um, if it can learn, if it can hit the books, if it can have training, you can have a conversation with it, you teach it and can actually do the, do the job. It'll be, it'll be very, very obvious that we are on, on the right track. The current AI that we have are, are all narrow. They're trained in batch in the factory. They cannot learn interactively. They cannot reason. So once you have all of these abilities that we find in a human, you know, in, in, in average intelligent human or even below average intelligent human the conversation you can have what they can learn what you they can teach you they can teach they can learn they can do they can solve problems um you know anything they come across when you know when we have that we'll 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 know it it'll it'll be super obvious okay, okay. thanks all right yeah um did we miss anyone um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Peter. Um, I would just like to remind uh, all of those who came in later, uh, there is a recording of this session and uh, Peter had said some um, valuable uh, uh, opinions um, earlier. So uh, you can listen to the replays and um, on my Twitter, there are there's a list of articles that Peter had written before and you can use that as reference. Yeah. yeah, so um, Peter, um, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, thank you for your generosity, and uh, we hope to have you back again sometime in the next months. So, yeah, um, any parting thoughts for us? Yeah, no, thank you. This was, this was fun, uh, as, as always. Enjoyed it. A um, lot, of, lot of good questions. Thanks, everyone. And, yeah, if you want to, uh, if you want to, uh, chat you can you can find me on uh, LinkedIn Facebook and Twitter and as I say my, my articles are on medium.com and you can also go to my company website igo.ai A-G-I A-I-G-O sorry A-I-G-O dot A-I so yeah thank you um, um we will, we will certainly request you to be back soon uh, in the next months, maybe. And I hope that uh, you would accommodate us. All right. Yeah. So. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Bye. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much, everyone, um, for supporting the room. We could we hope to bring more uh, good conversations with you and uh, uh, good resource speakers. So in case you have suggestions or you have uh, resource speakers whom you can bring here, please uh, back channel us. And uh, yeah, I don't know if uh, Shara or, or um, Abyss has any last words. 
So if not, I'm just going to announce the coming rooms that we have. Um, yeah, tomorrow evening we will be talking about, I think this is about Snell's law, law again. It's reflection, transmission, and refraction. There's so much to be discussed. As it has uh, a lot of implications, and I think there are several significant papers which came out uh, recently um, in relation to this. And uh, actually, I am inviting somebody from UPenn to talk about the uh, a recent paper on this and its uh, use cases. So um, in the coming week, uh, we have uh, Gerdel's incompleteness theorem and uh, um, our resource person will be talking about the halting problem and the MRDP theorem. And uh, yeah, um, on the later part of the week, um, there is a paper presented by my friend who is uh, um, a CEO of a company dealing with longevity and uh, she will be speaking about age reprogramming of super centenarian cells so um, yeah I think it's uh, a very good uh, um, guide to longevity so yeah please watch out for that and uh, at the end of the week at about the same time we have Chris Armstrong who's going to talk about transhumanism again and yeah we may have time to take your questions so uh, please follow quantum photonics and uh, yeah check our schedules so thank you so much everyone thank you for your support um, so now we go to their cell thank you Cecile and the best I really enjoyed the room all right so we, we're gonna start with lucky number seven are you ready ready Ready. Seven. Seven. And Cecile and my Romulan brother, Abyss, call out number one. <laughs> one. <laughs> one. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good oh, day. Yeah. Have a good day wherever you are in the world. Yeah, see good you. Good night. Bye. Have good dreams. <laughs>